Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha, it's Thursday, 3 o'clock, and again, it's your time to watch Condo Insider, a show all about association living. Very good for board members and very good for homeowners alike. I would just want to tell you in the beginning that uh, those of you who follow the Hawaii Council of Community Associations, they're doing a board member training seminar on May 12th. It's a half-day seminar at the uh, Fort de Russi, and it's going to be a great seminar, so go on HCCA and check it out. And if you're a new board member and want a really good primer on what it's like to be a board member, sign up. Very cheap. Anyway, you know, I was doing some seminars at the Expo Douglas trade shows in March, and I was giving one about peace and harmony in associations. And we started talking about the issues that cause the greatest number of mediations and complaints in condo associations. And I was kind of shocked by some of the answers when I did like a vote in the audience what they thought was the truth and what the truth was regarding insurance. So I asked my good friend Sue Savio from Insurance Associates to come back and talk to us and give us a primer on various issues of association insurance. But first, welcome back, Sue, and tell us a little bit about your company again. Well, thank you for having me back. Um, I'm an independent insurance agent. I've been in the business since 1975. I write mainly condominiums. That's my main book of business. Uh, right now, I'm a little over a thousand, and I own condos as well, and sit on boards as well. So I have it from both sides. And you've also served on the board of Community Association Institute and been as president, and very engaged. You're on the CAI Legislative Action Committee, so uh, yes. you probably eat, drink, and think condo world. That is true. I do. Well, let me tell you about this expo. I was giving this seminar okay. on various topics, and we were talking about mediations. What the number one cause for mediations in the state of Hawaii were. And everybody thinks it's probably some fight with the board, but the argument was, who's responsible for the payment? It's a fight over the payment amount. Either the board was willing for damage to an association, most likely a water claim. And so I asked the question to the audience. I said, if you have a water claim, how many do you think it's true you should always submit it to your master policy? And about less than half raised their hand. I said, how many think you never submit it to your master policy? And almost the, more than half raised their hand and said, no, it's the homeowner's responsibility. What do you got to say about that? Well, what I've got to say about it is the reason that half <laughs> think that, or more than half think it's the owner's responsibility, is because it's normally an owner's appliance, refrigerator, water line, whatever, leaking, and they feel that the owner should take care of it. The problem is the bylaws say that we've got to cover the building as originally built, inside and out, and we have a peril called water overflow, sudden and accidental, from a domestic plumbing system. So we are required to take care of the building as built. I tell people, if you had a fire, would you tell the unit owner to go call his own carrier and, do, and make the owner sell it by themselves? No, you'd file a claim under the master policy. It's the same thing with a water overflow claim. Now, if it's a little drip of water and there's a little small stain on the ceiling, you don't have to file it. But obviously, it's going to be close to the deductible, counting the extraction, you know, putting holes in the wall to dry out the walls, repainting, putting it all back. It's going to hit the association's normal deductible is like 5000 So yes, you need to file claims that are going to be near that deductible. You should always, though, make an incident report, no matter how small the claim, because it could grow. In other words, you think it's just a small claim, and you make an incident report, you know, six months ago this happened, and now all of a sudden it's a, some, a serious matter. We have all the details going back because an incident report was made. So you don't have to have to file the smallest of claims, but you do need to always make that incident report. The minute you think it's going to involve more than one unit, it more than likely is going to go over that $5,000 deductible. And you have to remember when water flows from one unit to another, it's flowing across a common element. There's yes, mold and these kinds of issues that can be affected with respect to that. But you brought up the magic word for part two of this, the okay. deductible. You know, it used to be in the old days, associations would have a $1,000 deductible, and now it's like $20,000 deductible. How did that all come about? Okay, you're right. Uh, the old days, $1,000 deductible. 5000 came out because as the buildings got older, there were more and more small water claims. So the insurance company said, we're not here as a maintenance policy. We're here for an insurance claim. And if you're not maintaining your appliances, all of a sudden we're becoming a maintenance policy because even though we don't repair your appliance, we're taking care of the damage done. So the insurance companies raised the deductible for 
the typical condo to 5,000. Then that was fine for a while. Then as the condos got even more old, we had 20 and 25,000, 50,000, because people are not maintaining their appliances. The association's having issues with common element pipes that are all rotting out as the condos are hitting 45 and 50 years of age. And the insurance companies are saying, we're here for your fire. We're here for the big claim, but we're not going to be a maintenance policy. So that's why the deductibles keep on going up. And how does that relate to the HO6 policy? The oh, magic the, question. Magic question that HO6 is so important. And HO6, just for anybody who's now listening and doesn't understand, is a homeowner's form six. It is a policy designed for condo unit owners, whether you're living in your unit or whether you rent it out. And if you have six condos, God bless you, you can have six HO6s. And this policy takes care of not only your upgrades, because remember, master policy as originally built, not upgrades. It takes care of your contents, if you have any in it. If you're a landlord, you may not. It takes care of your rental income, if you're a landlord. Loss of use, if you're an owner who can't live in your unit while it's being repaired. And it takes care of the association's deductible. So my appliance leaks, I damage your unit, Richard, and you've got, we have a $10,000 deductible. The association said, Sue Savio, you caused damage to Richard's unit, you, and it was $12,000. We got $2,000 from the insurance company. Cough up the $10,000. I can send that letter to my HO6 carrier, who maybe I have a $500 deductible on my policy. We'll cut the check for $9,500 to the association. I make up the $500. Thank God I have my HO6. Well, I think we saw from the famous Marco Polo fire right. the problems that are created when homeowners just take the HO6 policy for granted and don't look at their limits with regard to assessments, with regard to deductible for water claims, with regard to liability. That they need to put more energy into that. Lost rental income is another example. Right. You know, so I don't think homeowners look at the HO6, although I can honestly say after the Marco Polo fire. Working with you, you were able to assist me with all my property right. and get that all fixed up. And to be honest with the audience out there, even I, on my own HL6s for my rental units, after Marco Polo looked at it and said, hmm, I don't have enough coverage in certain parts of this policy, and upped it. And I think the problem is the HL6 is such an inexpensive policy. It's cheaper than auto insurance. So we just have a tendency to renew it, not even look at it, and we don't ever say, oh, my rental income has gone up from the $1,000 a month now to $1,500. Or, gee, I don't have any contents in there, but I did remodel the floor, or I did put in $10,000 worth of improvements, and we just kind of forget about it. And then when the fire hits, and, and some of those people are going to be out of their units for more than a year, all of a sudden you don't have enough rental uh, loss of use, and you have to go rent a place, you've got to pay maintenance fees. If you have a mortgage, you've got to pay mortgage. So it's really, there's this huge need for a robust HO6. Gone are the days when you can just buy the common everyday limits. It's not enough. Do you have any reaction to that recent lawsuit filed in Marco Polo by a tenant saying that uh, the association was negligent and the fire caused me to lose my personal belongings, I don't have an HO6 policy, you should pay? You know, don't get me started. I think everybody needs to stand on their own two feet. I buy a unit. I know that there's a master policy. It's my responsibility, I think, to make sure I have the coverage I need. I realize that people say, well, I didn't understand, I didn't know. I've always said people should take a test before they're allowed to buy a condo. And if you can't pass the test, you can't buy the condo because you don't understand how it works. And that's kind of what we're doing here, trying to tell people how important these things are. So do I think, we'll let the courts decide that one, but I could spend all day ranting and raving about owners who don't want to admit the fact that they blew it not the association, not the board. Another common thing that is said is don't file claims because it raises your premiums. What do you think? On the HO6, it doesn't raise your premiums, if that's what you're talking about. On the master policy, it doesn't necessarily raise your premiums, but what it tells the insurance company is, gee, 20 water overflow claims, seven of them from water heaters. Uh, this association needs to send out notice about these water heaters. The association needs to do something. That's what it tells the insurance company. If we're paying on all of these claims, the insurance company at some point in time is going to say, time to up the deductible, you folks aren't taking care of things, or hey, association, what are you doing about it? Now, if the association says we're doing a plumbing inspection, we're having a plumber go into each unit, we're going to expect water, every water-bearing appliance, we're going to force our owners to repair 
or if they don't repair the appliance, we're going to come back ourselves and repair it and charge it to them. That's the kind of thing the insurance company wants to see. They don't want to see a board that says, oh, well, we have insurance, let them pay, you know, because it just doesn't work that way. And I had an owner who uh, knew I was doing this show today about insurance who gave me this example. Okay. The louver windows in the high-rise condominium, according to the declaration, are a common element, a responsibility of the association. Okay. However, the maintenance and repair of those windows are the unit owner's responsibility. Assume for a moment one of those glass louvers falls out and it hurts somebody. Who's on the hook? Okay, I've had that claim. It's a combination. Both parties will be sued. The person who's unit it came from, as well as the association, because it fell on somebody in the common element areas. What will happen is the insurance company for the association will defend the association, explaining that it's their job to insure it. We have them insured, but it's not the job of the association to maintain those uh, louvers. This association where I had the claim had actually sent out notices to the owners to inspect your louvers, make sure they're tight. We've had a couple of issues. And of course, you, not everyone does what they're supposed to do. So the unit owner better have his HO6 in this instance because he's going to be sued as an individual. We'll defend him as a member of the association, but not as an individual, because they're going to sue the association and unit owner A. So unit owner A needs to hire his own attorney to defend him. If he has his HO6 policy, his insurance company is there to back him and help him. And from my little experience in this world, yes. hiring attorneys is not cheap. Oh, no. You're better off having an HO6 policy and have the insurance company defending you, and then you have maybe some reasonable pocket of funds available from the liability policy to uh, cover you for the window that accidentally fell out. Right, and you've got to remember that probably the price of an attorney for an hour is the price of a homeowner's six for a year. So in other words, I'd rather spend my money buying a homeowner's policy and hopefully not even have to spend an hour of an attorney's time and for the same cost. Well, I'd guess. Yeah. You've seen a lot of HO6 policies. Yep. Do you see people looking at this more? you think it's still a problem people don't understand? I would say because of the Marco Polo fire and the Oahu Tower fire, m more people are looking at it. We've had people call and ask questions. We've had more, more saying, well, you know, questioning what coverage is what and where does it, I get coverage for that. They're trying to understand it. So I think as bad as the Marco Polo fire is, as much as we hate to lose lives, at least some good is coming out where other people are saying, wait a minute, I live in condo land, I have a condo, am I insured correctly? And then briefly, because I know you insured Marco Polo. How's it doing now? It's doing very well. I'm sure the people who live there are wishing <coughs> it could go faster, but you have to understand there's building permits to get, insurance company has, they're started already. I think they're, I, don't, I won't say they're halfway through, but they are doing floors by floor by floor. It's a tough one because there's a lot of asbestos and other things in the building, and so it's going to be a long process, and there will be people out for over a year, and you feel for them. Yeah, I see that, and I was talking to one of the attorneys recently, and he was saying people don't realize that when you have a fire like that, in the beginning you're not sure, even today they don't know the cause, that they've got to put everybody on notice so that the air conditioning, the refrigerator, or the stove can send their own experts in because if you later found out that they might be a defendant, you can't be repairing it and taking away their right to inspect right. and protect themselves. So there's a, a period of time where you really can't do much while all this is sorted out to protect everybody's best interest on the legal side of it as well. That is true and we did have, every insurance company was notified with whether the, that there was this opportunity to come within this time frame to come and look, do your inspection. I mean, we didn't even know if they had coverage there or not, but we tried to notify every insurance company. Well, the article I read in the paper within the last day or two about Marco Polo was basically saying, or at least the owners who were interviewed were saying they were happy with the communication, they were happy with the progress, they understood the situation. But I do know, because we're dealing with it as a company right now, a couple people who just are in desperate need of help. They have no place to go. Right. They don't have the income stream. They didn't have insurance. That are in desperate need of health. And, and I know that uh, we have contributed as a company 100,000 towards that. And, and we are announcing very shortly tomorrow that we're contributing another 50,000 to help those people. But the problem is buy an HO6 policy and, and protect yourself. You know, you, it's, it's only 
I'm going to say 300 bucks a year, maybe. Probably, probably about 300, 350 dollars. I mean, you got a lot of stuff, and you got a lot of upgrades. It could be more, but again, you know, you need the basics at least. So yes. Okay. Well, we're going to take a short break for a minute, okay. and we'll come back and talk about policies in general. We'll be right back with Condo Insider. Match day is no ordinary day. The pitch, hallowed ground for players and supporters alike. Excitement builds. Game plans are made with responsibility in mind. Celebrations are underway. Ready for kickoff, MLS clubs and our supporters rise to the challenge. We make responsible decisions while we cheer on our heroes and toast their success. Elevate your match day experience. If you drink, never drive. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands about working together, working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation every other Monday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Welcome back to Condo Insider. We're talking about association insurance, and we were helping, I think, dispel some of the myths about claims and water claims and what the master policy includes. But I'm going to remind everybody that when you have a water claim and you're in a condo, the master policy covers these overflows of sinks and ice makers breaking, and depending on the size of the claim, it needs to be reported and a notice done with regard to uh, the actual incident so we can protect the association. That being said, this kind of just review the basic policies associations have to have, or uh, I think by law. So let's begin with the big one, the property insurance. Okay, the property insurance is a big one because it's usually the most expensive one. If you have property, and it, even if you're a community association, you may have a sign that you want to insure or a gate guard, guarded gate or something of that sort, you would need property insurance. For a high rise, obviously they've got a big building that's worth millions and we have to insure it. So the property policy by the condo statutes is required to be insured to 100% replacement cost. All right, so you can't say, oh, it's a concrete building, only 50% will ever burn, or 20% I'm going to insure for that value. You have to insure it to value, because it's required by condo statute. So we do have a property policy. And then along with that, we're going to have certain coverages like building ordinance, which will then give additional money, because your building was built in the 70s, and the codes have changed, and now that you have a big fire, we have to upgrade things to the building, and you need to add additional funds, not only just the as-built, but you need now additional funds. So that's building ordinance. And there's other types of coverages that come with it. So the property policy is the most expensive if you have a lot and, of property. And I know the word is co-insurance. So if you intentionally only insured the building for 50% of its value because you misstated the replacement costs, how does that affect the policy? Okay, so it affects the policy in that if you only insure for 50% of a loss, a percent of the value, you're only going to get 50% of your loss or less. Because let's say you have a $100,000 fire. The insurance company comes out, the adjuster does his thing, he estimates the value of the building, he says, gee, you insured for 20 million, you're supposed to be insured for 40 million, you had a $100,000 loss, you're only going to get 50% of your loss. Oh, and by the way, you have a $5,000 deductible, so now the $100,000 is down to $50,000 minus the $5,000 deductible, you're down to $45,000 on a $100,000 loss. You have to insure to value. Okay, the co-insurance clause says that we agree that this is the value and you're going to insure to at least 90 or 100%, depending upon what co-insurance clause you have. So it is important to make sure you keep up with the rising cost of construction. And what a building was built for back in the 70s and 80s, and what it would cost today is at least double. And how does this flood and hurricane fit into all this? Okay, hurricane is part of the property policy. So if the hurricane comes or a windstorm comes, you have coverage under the property policy. The only difference is the deductible that the hurricane has. Wind has the standard deductible like the fire policy, you know, the $5,000 deductible. The hurricane is a percentage. It's either a 1% or a 2% of the building value. So if you had a low rise with 10 buildings and only two got damaged by a hurricane, it would be 2% of that, those buildings that got damaged. 
take a high rise, there's just one big building. So their co-insurance, I mean, their deductible is either one or two percent of their building value. So that's how hurricane works. It's just a higher deductible, but it's covered the building as built inside and out. So whether it's the windows that blow out and the sliding glass doors and all your cabinets and appliances, that's all under the master policy. But if it blows out your contents or the rain comes in and trashes your contents and your beautiful wood floor, that's your policy if you have hurricane. And how about flood? Flood is only in, carried by projects that are required. They are in a mandated flood zone uh, along the Alawai, of, of course, along the ocean. Uh, if I'm up on the mountain, I don't have to have flood. I'm not in a mandated flood zone. And flood covers things like tsunami. Mother Nature drops 20 inches of rain and, you know, it enters into the units. That type of thing is flood, not appliance overflow. And so with, with flood insurance, like a high rise, mm -hmm. did you again insure the whole building? You have to insure the whole building. You question why, because if, if the flood ever got to the 20th floor, we're not going to be here to pay any claims. We're all dead. But Build an ark. Build, yeah, build an ark. But I think the reason is that in the old days, when I first started in this business many years ago, they used to do an 80 percent. FEMA used to let you do an 80 percent on flood if it was a high rise. And I think basically they've lost so much money on the flood, they said, no, we're going to make everybody insured to 100 percent value because they collect more money, even though they're still in arrears. Let's say, so we have property insurance mandated by law. Right. How does that differ from general liability? Okay, general liability is just that. It's liability coverage for the association for things like in the common elements, limited common elements, someone slips and falls, someone gets hurt at the pool, you have a spa, someone gets hurt in the spa or on your weight equipment. It covers things that happen in the common and limited common areas. Like louvers falling out of the like window. Like louvers falling out, out of the window, window and landing on somebody's shoulder at the pool causing $125,000 worth of damage. Well, then I'm going to kind of skip on one. I'm going to say the umbrella is next, because I'd like you to also comment about the fact some people say it's better to have a lower limit for the liability and a higher limit for the umbrella. And maybe you can describe what an umbrella is and then okay. dispel any myths on that. Okay, so if you think of an umbrella, okay, on the handle of the umbrella is going to be your general liability policy going to be your workers' comp policy, going to be your director's and officer's policy. Or if you have an automobile for the association as an automobile, it would be on that too, the general handle part. The minute we use up the, any of these limits, whether we have a horrible DNO claim, whether we have a horrible accident in the pool and somebody wins more than the $2 million on our general liability policy, the umbrella part, the part that you whip up to protect you from the rain, that's going to pay above these policies. So yes, it makes more sense to spend money on a good size umbrella because you've got all these policies underneath it, but you have to have certain limits before the umbrella carrier will cover. So on an auto policy, they want you to have a million. On a general liability policy, they want you to have the two million for the occurrence. Directors and officers, most will accept a million dollars. So you have to have at least these limits so that when there, we do go above them in a claim settlement, the umbrella carrier then kicks in the additional funds. So if you rate that as an umbrella rating, a little less expensive than the general liability, you know, like the two million example you gave. So it's, to buy a three million umbrella to have a five million dollar coverage, is that better economically for you to do it that way? A lot better economically. Plus, not only is it above the general liability, it's above the other policies we talked about. It is much cheaper to spend your extra hard-earned maintenance dollars for insurance on an umbrella policy. I have many a board that will say, gee, we only have a million because you have a new board member. He says, a million dollars, that's not enough. And I say, but you have a five million umbrella. You have a 10 million umbrella. You know, that's where the coverage, the money should be put in to expand. What is the average umbrella for an association? You today? know, for a smaller association, when I started in this business, it was two million. Then it went to three. Small associations carry five now. Because of the fires we've been having and the liability exposure and what can happen, We've been recommending to most people that they up their five million to ten. We have many people going to twenty-five million. Uh, people are saying, "Hey, for another five, six, seven hundred dollars, why am I not buying the best protection? Because I have five hundred owners and I've got their assets to worry about, or I have three hundred owners and projects that have you know a thousand owners. There's nothing for them not to have a fifty million umbrella." Okay, DNO policy. What is it? Okay, directors and officers serve for free, and I know because I do as well. And what that policy does is protect the directors in case someone thinks we made a bad decision, even if it was a good decision, and decide to sue the board. So what the board wants to do, and the owners who elect the board, they want to make sure that maintenance money 
isn't going to need to go for law fees to protect the board. So they, by a directors and officers policy, and for decisions that are made, good, bad, or indifferent, there's this policy that was going to hire the attorney, that's going to pay to protect the board. If they lose, they're going to pay the, the settlement, and all for insurance dollars. Does it cover committee members that are board? It does cover committee members, whether they're board members or not. So in other words, we decide to have a landscaping committee, and we have somebody that's not on our board and wants to join the landscaping committee with two or three other people, they're covered. It's a committee of the association. OK. The other policy is sometimes called crime policy, sometimes called a fidelity bond. Right. I don't know if there's a difference or not. but Not really. Uh, what, what is that? OK. That's protecting the association's funds. Because everybody's putting their hard-earned dollars into maintenance fees, when we into reserves, into everyday operating expenses. So when we expect it to be there when we need it. If for some reason uh, somebody stole it or, it or took it for different reasons or and it is amazing how people come, can, are very clever. You want the insurance company to say, yes, you lost $100,000. We will go ahead and you know, make that up to you. The premium is relatively inexpensive, a couple hundred bucks a year. So you know, it's a well worth it. Yeah, I think by statute, the managing agent, if you have a managing agent, also by law has to have a fidelity yes. and crime policy. And if actually, if in fact you had a loss and for some reason the policy didn't cover it, and you went through all the other hoops and there was a conviction and a, an arrest that the real estate fund actually has a recovery fund. Right. But to be honest with you, the, the requirements are so great yeah. and most people have sufficient crime policies. I don't think I've ever seen it tapped. You know? I can't either. I've had bond claims and we have paid out on them and we're glad that we could pay out on them. Okay, last question before we have to end the show. We could talk for hours, I know. When you have a policy come for renewal, do you just renew it or you go out and get bids or oh, compare? No. Or what, what, what does an agent do? Okay, about 90 to 120 days before renewal, the agent fills out an application, gathers all the loss runs for the last five years, gets some information about the things they're doing so the losses don't look as bad because we've had 10 water claims, but we've done a plumbing inspection or we're going to replace our pipes gets proof of all of that, oh, we've replaced our roofs and we hurricane clipped. Whatever the case may be, we get as many good things as we can to add to our application, shoot it out to the marketplace, and get in our quotes. Even though we shoot it out 90 to 120 days prior, we probably start to get quotes in 30 days before the expiration date. Uh, underwriters call with questions. Some say, nah, I got too much on the LOI, I don't want any more. Or, hey, I got six buildings in a row, I'm skipping this one, Sue. So we go through that ritual. And then we go out and get the quotes line them all together, and then present the best to the association. Well, I think within 30 minutes, we've done an amazing job of going through a very complex subject on insurance. And I hope uh, our audience paid attention because there's very useful information in this. And I want to thank you for being on Condo Insider today. You're always there to help out and help our industry. You've been that way for years. And I appreciate your friendship and all you do for the community. And thank you for being here today. And thank also from me. Condo Insider, we look forward to you coming next week to see the show. We're going to be talking about when you have a claim about what these remediation companies do that come in suddenly to help you at least get the plumbing stopped and the water cleaned up and, and the things you do uh, when you f first have a claim and how that works. So again, thank you for watching Condo Insider. See you next week.